Ah, okay. Uh, this is, I like things that are Chinese, as you'll, you'll see if you visit my web page. Uh, this is a, a nice thing in, in Chinese. It says, Jian zhi yi, shui zhi nan, which translates, when you look at it, it seems easy. But then when you start to study it, you find out it's hard. And you know what's going to happen? Is you're going to watch me, and you're going to watch your TAs, and we're going to just be able to answer a problem, and we're just not even going to have to think about it. We just do it by instinct, automatically. And you're going to say, ah, oh, well, this class is easy. Look at that TA. Look at that instructor. They didn't even have to think about it. I don't need to practice. When it comes time for the midterms, I'll just be able to do it just like them. It doesn't work. It looks easy because we've practiced. And we've practiced a lot. I have manned uh, probably 10,000 hours of time helping students solve calculus problems in the equivalent of the SMC at my university. And I was really bad at calculus when I started. I got a C in my high school algebra class. It took work. And so you need to make sure you put in the work. And that's why homework is really important. Homework, I really don't care whether or not you do it by yourself or you do it in groups. Or I care that you do it because you need to learn the material. And that's how you're going to do it. Um, not that it's completely related here, but I will say that there's two important things that students need to learn to really succeed in calculus courses. I was talking to my cousin about this during Christmas break. He teaches calculus at a high school. And I was telling him, the two things that students need to learn is, first off, they're not that as bad at calculus as they think they are. When students struggle in calculus, it's because they're bad at algebra and arithmetic. What they do is they do the problem correctly, but they make a stupid addition error. Or they make a copying error. They get the wrong answer, and automatically they assume they don't understand calculus. No. I would say probably two-thirds of the time it's because they did the problem right, they just made a stupid error, and once they you point out the stupid error, they're like, ah, I understand now, I feel so much better about myself. So make sure you understand the basics, arithmetic and algebra, and especially on test, take the time to double check your work. I have made stupid mistakes in my life that I could have caught if I just sat down and took 30 seconds to double check. Okay, that was the first thing. The second thing that you really need to learn is you need to learn how to identify when to use a, a certain technique. Because we're going to cover a lot of different techniques throughout this quarter. And different techniques should be used at different times. If you use the wrong technique at the wrong time, your answer will look very bizarre. And you're going to leave the TA scratching their heads when they're grading the midterm thinking, what was that student thinking? This rule doesn't even apply here. It happens every quarter I've ever taught calculus. So make sure you have the right tools and you know how to use the tools. There's an old saying, if the only tool you have is a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. So every problem is not a nail. So make sure you have the right tools. OK. So we're doing calculus. And I want to share with you the idea behind calculus. And I got to tell you, I never learned this when I took calculus. It wasn't pointed out to me. I only learned this about a year later in a different class. And, and when they were explaining this to me, it's like, oh, that's what calculus is about. Now I understand really what's going on. So this is sort of a one sentence idea behind calculus. So it starts out. We understand flat things pretty well. What's an example of a flat thing? Well, a rectangle. We're a rectangle holics. We love rectangles. We understand them because we can measure them. You say, what's the area? Length times width. We don't even have to think about it. We know them. We love them. There's a problem. A lot of things that we see aren't flat. They have curves. We don't like curves. We don't know how to say, look at that shape there and say, what's the area? So now calculus comes to the rescue. So here's the idea. So what we do is we approximate things that are not flat, like that shape, by things that are flat, like a rectangle. So in this case, suppose I want to find the area. What can I do? Well, I can take that shape, and I just chop it up into little tiny pieces. 
And I can essentially say the little pieces either look like full rectangles or anti rectangles. This is an approximation. It's, it's depending upon how, how fine we chop it up, it's a good or bad approximation. Well, of course, we can get better and better approximations. Okay, so that's really the idea behind calculus. We're going to try to look at things which aren't flat, and we're going to understand them using things which are flat. All right. Now, I should say this example here is kind of jumping the gun a little bit. This is a problem from integral calculus. And you might know that we have two types of calculus we're going to look at this quarter. We have the differential calculus. And I apologize, I forgot to bring all my fancy colored whiteboard markers. So next time I'll have more colors. It'll be very colorful. Um, and there's the other half is called integral calculus. Now these two kinds of calculus, they study different kinds of questions. Differential calculus asks the kind of question, how fast is something changing? Now, the something can depend upon what the question is. Something could be area, something could be the volume, something could be distance, something could be population. But in general, differential calculus asks this question. How fast is it changing? Integral calculus asks a different question. How much is the total? Again, depends on the question. Total what? Total area, total volume, total population, total distance. Well, a long ago, let's see, probably about, I don't know, three, four hundred years ago, there's a young kid, Isaac Newton. He had the summer off. And he realized, wait a second, I have these two questions here that people have been studying. And historically, integral calculus came first. And this dates back to at least Archimedes, this idea of, of the tools of integral calculus. I, I, I can see that people are interested in this question, how fast is something changing? I can see people are interested in this question, how much is the total? But you know, these are really related questions. In other words, if I know what the total is at any time, I can tell you how fast something is changing. And if I know what I started with, I know how fast it's changing, I can tell you what the total is at any time. So they're related to one another, and this was actually the fundamental theorem of calculus which said, lo and behold, we can use the same tools to answer both questions. Now, we will not get to the fundamental theorem of calculus for quite a while be because we need to build up the tools so that it makes sense what we'll, we'll say. All right, but this is a quick overview of what's going to be going on this quarter. So we really want to start with differential calculus. How fast is something changing? That will be our starting point for today. All right, so let's suppose we try to use this. Our idea behind calculus. We want to understand how fast something is, is changing. Well, what do we understand? We understand things that are flat really well. So what's something that's flat? Uh, I'm sorry. I, I broke one of the fundamental laws of, of math classes. One of the fundamental laws of math classes is that whenever you ask a question, oh dear, where did I put the pen? Okay, we'll go to chalk. Whenever you ask a question in math class, you should only have one of three answers. It should either be zero, one, or somewhere on the board. Okay, so I will try to obey this law as much as I can. All right, so what's something that's flat that we understand really well? A line, look, see, it's on the board. I, I was very clever that time, I prepared. Okay, we understand lines really, really well. So really our starting point is going to be lines. So we know what a line looks like, nice and flat. And we also have the equation for a line drilled into our head. So we think we understand lines pretty well. In fact, I would say we do. Y equals mx plus b. What is b? Yeah, b is the y-intercept. 
And this is not the important part. The important part is what is m? Yeah. m is the slope. The slope of the line. How do you find the slope? Yeah, slope is you take two points on the line. And in fact, if you have two points, you can always find the line uniquely. I, I should pause here and say this is a, an important fact we'll point out later. To find a line, you either need two things. Two points, and then you just essentially connect the points. Or one point and a slope. All right. So what's the slope? Well, the slope is found by taking the rise, which is the difference in the y coordinates, divided by the run. We call this rise over run. But we could also write it in a couple different ways. Suppose that this point here is x1, y1, and this point here is x2, y2. Then the rise over the run, well, the rise is the difference in the y coordinates, y2 minus y1. And the run is the difference in the x coordinates, x2 minus x1. Which we also abbreviate delta y over delta x. When we see a delta, you just think change in. And usually we tend to think of a small change in, but really it's just how much has y changed. So it's the change in y over the change in x. So this is the rate of change of y with respect to the variable x. So that the slope here is measuring a rate. It's measuring how fast the y changes as you change the x-coordinate. And if I were to bring this down for a second, you know what differential calculus was saying was how fast is something changing? So for lines, it's really easy. We know how fast something is changing because that's measured by the slope. See, we understand that flat thing really well. We understand lines really well. Lines are simple. If I want to know how fast something is changing, I look at the slope, and I have the answer. Of course, now we have a problem. We usually don't see lines when we go out and measure stuff. We see other shapes coming in. All right. So how do we handle that? OK, let me make sure I've said everything I want to say about lines, because there's just so many wonderful things about lines. They're just so cool. OK. All right, so we understand lines, but a lot of things that we see aren't lines. So for instance, we might have some kind of function doing something like this. We're measure something. Well, let's suppose that the x-axis is measuring hours, and the y-axis is measuring the gallons in a tide pool. Let me turn on the blackboard lights here. I don't know if that helps very much. OK. Sorry. Um, now we want to see how fast is it changing. Notice, before when we had a line, it doesn't really matter where we looked. Because we're always going to get the exact same slope, so it's sort of independent. Now, how fast is it changing? Well, it depends. Depends when we look at it. We can say some things that are pretty obvious. So for instance, if I look between these two points, what can I say? It's decreasing. So that the rate that water is going in, well, it's actually going out. And similarly, if I were to say, look over here, it's increasing. The water's going in. So I could say something like the rate is positive. Things are flowing out. But what if I wanted to say measure at a specific time? Let's suppose here is at time five hours after I start. And I wanted to ask the question, how fast is water coming in or leaving that tide pool at that time? OK, so let's apply our rubric here. We understand lines really well. Now we have something that's not a line. How do we solve our problem? How do we figure out what to do with it? 
Well, we want to approximate things that are not flat by things that are flat. Well, that's not looking very flat to us, but now here's what we do. We pull out our old magnifying glass and we look at it closely. Okay, we can do that. So I look at this closely, say, well, still not looking very lineish to me, but it has less curves, so that's good. Okay, well, well, let's pull out our old microscope. Okay, I can do that. Hey, you know, that's looking a lot more like a line. I can still see a little bit of a bend, though. Okay, that's no problem. Let's pull out our electron microscope. And I'm like, whoa. Now, you know, when I look at it really closely, I don't see all these curved things going on. I see a line. It looks flat. And that's really the secret to our first part of the course, is that even though we have these things which aren't flat, nearby, when we look close enough, it looks flat. And if it looks flat, we can say, well, it basically looks like a line. If I can figure out what that line is, I can use that line to tell me the rate of change. Because the slope of that line should be the rate of change. So now our goal is, what does this line look like? What is this line? Now, of course, this isn't a line. This is part of the curve. So the actual tangent line, if I were to come in and dash, it would basically be almost right on top of it if I looked here. Over here, if I were to look far away, it would look nearby, it would touch at that single point. Of course, as I go farther away, it gets worse and worse and worse. Of course, I used a, a term I haven't defined yet, a tangent line. So the word tangent, you can think of as being touch. It's, it's okay, though. This is kind of appropriate touching, you know, not the sexual harassment kind of touching. No, this is, this is okay. We can touch. So we're just going to touch the curve at that single point. Um, so essentially the tangent line is what is this line? It's the line that looks like the curve function does at that point. Okay. And really we don't even care about the line. Because what we're asking is how fast is it changing? Really what we care about is the slope. Okay. So now our goal is to find our slope. Now, if I had the power of unerasing, I would unerase over here and say, okay, what was it that we used to find the slope? We used two points, right? Now, we have a problem. If I'm touching, how many points do I actually touch at? One. Now, I know what you're going to say, but hold on. I see this picture over here. See, there's a second point there, right? No, no. But I don't know what that point is. It's locally, I only touch at one point. So, <sighs> darn it. We were doing so good. We knew all we had to do was find the line, but we can't find a line with just one point. So how do we do, do this? Okay. Well, we do know how to find a, a line with two points. Let me cover this up. I. So let's try that. And we won't find a tangent line, because it's not touching at one point. We'll find what's called a secant line. OK, blue does not erase well. Could be worse. I once saw a professor give a lecture, and he only discovered halfway through he was using permanent marker. So fortunately, he discovered that he could flip the board around, because it was, it was a board that you know, was on, on wheels. So he flipped the board around, and then he could continue. But, all right. Oh, that's right. I put the board up because I don't know where the blue eraser is. All right. Never mind. When I find the blue marker, I'll go back to that board. Okay. Oh, all that excitement of putting the board down and back. Here we are. Okay. So, I have my function. I want to find the slope of our tangent line, but we don't have enough information yet. So instead of trying to find a tangent line, the tangent line, remember, is the line that will just come through and, and touch. And locally, if I were to zoom in close enough, it looks like the function. 
instead of finding that line, what I'm going to do is here's x, I'm just going to pick another point nearby, A. And I'll look at that line. So if this is the tangent line, this slope, sorry, this line is called the secant line. And we touch at two points. Now because we touch at two points, well, that gives us two pieces of information, which is enough for us to find the line. This point right here is at x, f of x, because it's at the x-coordinate is x, and if I want to find the y-coordinate, I plug it into the function, where, of course, here I'm assuming that y is my function f of x. The other point, of course, is at a, f of a. Again, my x-coordinate is a. If I want to know the y-coordinate, I plug a into my function. Got to make sure you use the right eraser on the right board. Okay. All right. So now how do you find the slope? Well, rise over run. Our, remember, it's our delta y over delta x. So we take the difference in the y coordinates. It doesn't matter which one we use first. So I'll say it's f of x minus f of a. And we take the difference in the x coordinates, which are x and a. So the slope of the secant line is f of x minus f of a divided by x minus a. All right. So is this any good? Well, not really. If you look at our picture, it's kind of crummy, actually. This slope looks like it's, you know, maybe 45 degrees going up. This slope looks like it's flat or maybe even going down. So maybe it's not a great approximation. But how can we make it a better approximation? Yeah, I can choose a different point, because really I'm only interested about the point here, x. What happens here? And remember what happened is, it's when we zoomed in close that it started looking flat. So if I really want things to look like the line, I shouldn't choose an A far away, because that's kind of ridiculous. I should choose an A close by. So if I choose a different point, and I choose that, draw that secant line, you'll notice that this secant line compared to that one, well, this one is a lot closer, in some sense, closer, quotation marks. Can I do better? Well, yeah, I could do a lot better. I just choose a point even closer. Choose a point nearby, go a little bit closer, and now I start getting really close to that tangent line. As I let A get closer and closer, well, that secant line starts to look more and more like the tangent line. Now, of course, we can't say get closer and closer because that doesn't sound very professional and we don't get a big salary. So we have to say, we'll take a limit. That's how we get our big salaries. All right. Now, before we go on, though, into really talking about limits, which are, are the, the fun topic this week, and uh, I will say we're going to be in and out of limits really, really fast. This week, it's you know, like a band-aid, just rip it off, get it out of the way, and then we'll move on. Uh, so this week is limits week. Uh, before we do that, I need to, to just point out a couple of things here. Um, occasionally, you'll be asked about units. What are the units of this? What are the units of that? So if I go back to this example where I had a time tide pool, the units down in the x-coordinate were time and hours, and the units on the y-coordinate were gallons. What's the units of the slope? Well, let's just think about it. The top part is measuring the difference in the y. Well, what was y? y was gallons. So this is really measuring a difference in y of gallons. The bottom part was measuring a change in x. Now, x is measured in time, and specifically, it's hours. So a small change in x is really corresponding to a measurement of hours. 
so that here, if I'm looking at this picture, the graph y equals f of x is measuring how many gallons there are at a specific time. The slope of a secant line and similarly the slope of a tangent line measure something of the rate. And it's the rate of the y coordinate with respect to the x, sorry, it's the rate of the y units with respect to the x units. So in this case, gallons per hour. So it's, it's very easy to remember how you do the units. I think there's only like two or three questions that this ever comes up on the whole quarter, but I want to make sure you get your money's worth. So now you know. And knowing is half the battle. Okay, gallons per hour. Now, there's another thing we need to talk about in that when I do a secant line, I do find a rate. Because I am measuring something here. That slope of that secant line is a rate. It's not, though, an instantaneous rate. So when I look at the tangent line, I'm trying to say, what is the rate of change at that specific instant of time? If I were to freeze it, how fast is it changing at that moment? A secant line also looks at a rate, but it looks at a different kind of rate. So what rate is it? Well, this is looking at what's known as the average rate of change. And specifically, it's the average rate of change, and I'll spell it all out, of f of x, the function, between x and a. Another way to think about what the average rate of change is, is you'd say, OK, now the function isn't behaving like a line. But if it were behaving like a line, what would have to be the rate of change of that line? Or what would have to be the slope of that line so that I was at this point at x and I was at this point of a? So in other words, what should I be if I were constant? That's what the average looks like. All right. So whenever you see the average rate of change, it's just very simple. It's the slope of the secant line at two points. And I'm sorry I'm not doing a lot of examples right now. Today we're just sort of building up some basic definitions. So there's, there's some examples in the book, and they have color, unlike me. So, so that's good. All right. Now, on to our last topic. You might say, well, Steve, you, you, you keep saying, let's just let A get close to X. Why can't we just let X equal A? You know, that's a fair question. Why can't we let X equal A? Oh, yeah. Because something bad happens. If X equals A, well, if I have F of X minus f of a over x minus a, these two are equal, and these two are equal, I get 0 divided by 0, the dreaded divide by 0. And most people don't remember very much from you know, junior high school arithmetic, but they remember don't ever divide by 0, because you know, it's very scary. You get yelled at. That, that one is like an ultimate no-no. Well, I want to take a second, though, and ask the question, why is it so bad? Why is divided by zero so bad? You know it is, but why is it? All right. Let me just go through it. So we say that A over B equals C. So this is what the definition of division means. A divided by B equals C if A is equal to B times C. That seems like a fairly standard thing to say. So as an example, 6 over 2 equals 3 because 6 equals 2 times 3. And that's really what it is. So that's what, how we define division. We say that one number divided by another number is equal to this if A is equal to B times C. And this is very fancy cross multiplication. OK, now let's, let's see what happens when we go to divide by 0. OK, so suppose, let's just say I have a over 0 equals c. 
Okay, so according to my definition, what should be true? Yeah, if A equals 0 times C. Now we see that two things can happen, and in fact, they're very different from one another. So divided by 0 is actually two things happening, not one thing. Now, what's the first bad thing that can happen? Well, what do we know about 0 times C? Yeah, 0 times anything is always 0. That's one of the wonderful properties about 0. Okay. So what happens if A is not 0? Well, if you have something that's not 0, it can't be equal to 0. So if A is not 0, this is just impossible. Can't happen, because you can't have a 0 number equal to a non-zero number. OK. But what about if A equals 0? Is the statement true now? Yeah, because look, you have 0 equals 0 times C. But now what's our problem? Which C do we choose? Because it doesn't matter. See, 0 over 0 is bad because, not that it's impossible, it's because it's ambiguous. 0 over 0 can be anything it wants to be. 1, 0. See, see, see how I, I worked in the 0 and the 1? 0, 1 are on the board. See, very clever. So 1, 0, a million, pi, uh, undefined. It can be undefined, too. So 0 over 0 is bad because it's ambiguous. And now, notice that we don't have a non-zero number over 0, because that's bad. That's just outright not going to work. We have 0 over 0. So the problem is not it's impossible or it's undefined. The problem is we don't know what it should be. And that's what limits do. Limits say, what should happen? So, let me erase this. Don't worry, divided by zero will not be on the test. That's just a little aside. One of those fun things you get to learn. Um, so, limits tell us what should happen based on what is happening nearby. So 0 over 0, I can't look at x equals a because it's undefined, it's ambiguous, I don't know anything. But what I can do is I can look at x close to A, and I say, well, what's happening here? What numbers should I expect? What should I get? That's what limits say. What should you get? OK. All right. And there's a wonderful definition. So some notation here. We look at limit as x approaches A of some function g of x equals L. And this means. And I'll, I'll, I'll say out loud, one of the things that tells us, that we do actually have a core sort of general outline that we're supposed to follow. One of the things that tells us is don't worry about the epsilon delta definition. I don't know if any of you have ever seen that before. So, so instead of doing epsilon deltas, we have to do some dance, modern interpretive dance. So we're getting close here, but we're not far here, you know, kind of thing. All right. What this is saying is, is this is the intuition. As x is getting close to a, g of x is getting close to L. That's what the limit is. It's saying, what is happening as you look close to this number A, what is this function doing? What would you expect to happen if I were to plug in A? So some examples. This is from the book. Here's, say, x, sine x over x. Now, sine x over x, this is actually a very important limit. And I'll just put it in parentheses here, x in radians. Because what we're going to do is very important that x is in radians. If it was in degrees, it won't work. And, and we'll see why x in radians is really important. We'll see this at the end of the week. And it's exactly because that sine x over x, uh, x in radians is nice, that we do radians to calculus and not degrees. So where's the problem here with sine x over x? Is there any problem? 
Yeah, when x equals zero is bad because you get zero in the denominator. What if the numerator is sine of zero, which hopefully sine of zero we know, da, 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 zero, okay. So we get zero over zero, which is bad. All right, so zero over zero is bad because it's ambiguous, so we're gonna ask what should happen. So the way we can do is we can plug in values for x. So for instance, I can plug in one. One is pretty far away. And I, I, I happen to have written this down. I don't know how to compute sine x over x in th off my head, but we can write, write it down beforehand. And we get some number. But really, you can't just look at a single number and say, aha, I know what's happening with the limit. You have to look at it. So what's happening as you're getting closer and closer? So let's look at another number, 0.1. Then you get, oh, so, so the first number here is 0.8414709. 0.998334. Okay, get closer still. 0.01. 0.999983. Okay, let's get a little bit closer. Oh, 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 one. 0.999998. So as we look at sine x over x, we don't know what's happening at zero, but I can look at nearby values. And I'm looking at these values here, and I see that as x is getting closer to zero, because eventually I want to get down to zero here, I look at these numbers and say, I think I see a pattern here. What's going on? Yeah, it's getting closer to one. And in fact, at the end of the week, we will show when as x goes to zero of sine x over x, is one, and it, as I said, that has to be for x in radians. Okay, I think that's enough for today. We will start again on Wednesday. We will be going really fast this week, so don't get lost. Go to section tomorrow if you have it on Thursday. If you didn't pick up, the syllabus is still here. Thank you.